Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we are going to deepen our studies on vampires and discuss the best ways to hunt, find and destroy these cursed creatures. Although these creatures of the night are classic Dungeons and Dragons villains, in the Ravenloft campaign setting vampires received great attention and development in order to become unique and complex opponents. The main book with information about these creatures is the Von Richten Guide to Vampires, a deep study of the blood drinking undead and the first in a series of scholar tomes about the horrors that inhabit the lands of the mist. This video will not be focused on game mechanics, but will be directly inspired by Ravenloft's old camping setting books about vampires especially in the 2nd edition era. If you play the 5th edition of Dungeons and Dragons, you see that there are some differences in the approach of vampires, but this video can be a useful source of information or even inspiration to create new and more dangerous enemies for your campaign. In this video we will explore their powers and weaknesses, their lairs and disguise in mortal society, and the best way to hunt and destroy these creatures. Are you ready? So take your sacred symbols and sharpen your wooden stakes, for today we will show these creatures that even the supernatural predators like vampires can become the prey on a hunt. How To face the thirsty undead, it is necessary to first understand their powers and weaknesses. However, a vampire hunter should be aware that a vampire is a unique creature, and their powers and weaknesses can vary dramatically from individual to individual. The records and research of Van Richten and other vampire hunters points to the existence of several vampiric strains and lineages and even within what we can consider a typical vampire. There are great differences in powers, according to his age, his history, and even the form of his creation. In this video we shall deal with the most common type of vampire, but vampire hunters must be alert not to make assumptions about their enemies before careful investigation, otherwise they will become victims of their own ignorance. Great are the powers of a vampire. Even the simplest of mortals, when transformed into a creature of the night, begins to enjoy keen senses and has his strength, agility, intelligence and charisma dramatically increase. Even a frail and weak mortal, when transformed into a vampire, becomes as strong as the strongest of mortals. This superhuman strength makes them fearsome opponents capable of inflicting great damage in battle, even when fighting unarmed. In addition to this great strength, vampires also enjoy supernatural agility. Some reports point to the existence of vampires that move as fast as galloping horses and are capable of acting or reacting with great speed, dexterity and coordination. The reasoning and cunning of these creatures is also increased in their undeath. These undead creatures have great intelligence and they become even more shrewd over the years. Many vampire hunters have already lost their lives when they were surprised by complex games of intrigue and strategies of these predators. The presence and personality of these creatures is also enhanced and they exert a magnetism on the people around them. Even without using their supernatural powers, a vampire usually becomes a skilled manipulator whose presence, charisma and influence become irresistible to many mortals. In addition to the vampiric transformation making them more capable in various attributes, most vampires still retain their abilities that they held as mortals. Vampires who in life turn into arcane studies or were rogues or fighters tend not only to maintain their abilities, but to improve their skills. 
now that they are endowed with enhanced attributes and senses, and have the time of immortality to expand their capabilities. However, clerics, unless devoted to profane and evil deities, tend to lose their connection with the divine and the sacred gifts of their fate. A Padin suffers the same fate, as his commitment and devotion to order and goodness is corrupted by his undead essence, and his connection with the sacred is immediately broken in the transformation. Regardless of the class as mortals, however, vampires acquire several supernatural powers after their transformation. A vampire's body is imbued with negative energy, and a vampire's touch can transmit necrotic energy capable of draining a victim's life force and energy. Victims of a vampire's touch may become weakened and unable to use their full strength and powers unless they receive the quick assistance of a powerful cleric. A vampire can also charm his victims, usually with eye contact. Victims of this power begin to see the vampire as an ally or even become slaves to his will. These undead are capable of climbing walls and walking on the ceiling, as if under the effects of a spider claim spell. This ability can be used by these creatures at any time, and they use it to reach unattainable locations or to surprise their victims. To hurt a vampire is not a simple task since ordinary weapons are not capable of hurting such creatures. Only magic weapons can tear the flesh of these monsters, or at least weapons that have been blessed by a cleric man, but these blessed weapons only cause minimal damage to the enemy. Even if injured, vampires still have a powerful regeneration, and their wounds close quickly, broken bones mend, and even severed limbs end up growing over time. Vampires are capable of shape changing, and one of their most impressive capabilities is that of turning into a gaseous form. In this vaporous form, these creatures are immune to any type of physical attack, as well as almost any type of magic. In this form, they remain conscious and able to control their movements, as well as their density and volume, while in the misty form. This transformation is also a form of protection, since when defeated in combat, their bodies automatically assume this form and immediately return to their legs and thumbs to recover. Vampires can also turn into beasts. The animal forms commonly used by these undeads are the form of large wolves and bats, but reports show that some vampires can adopt other animal forms. The transformation into this type of creature takes about a minute, in which the vampire is unable to take any other action. Transformation into animal form can heal the vampire previous wounds, and is widely used as a means of camouflage and espionage by these bloodthirsty predators. Vampires can summon some type of animals to serve and obey them, up to a mile away in distance. Wolves, bats and rats are the types usually summoned by these monstrosities, and usually come to the call of their masters, and stay under the mental control of these monsters, defending them with their own lives. Reports tell us that some vampires are able to communicate with these creatures, and use such servants as spies for their profane purpose. Vampires are also able to keep lesser undead under their control. It's not uncommon for these monsters to command zombies, skeletons, ghosts, or even other vampires to achieve their goals. A vampire hunter must be aware, however, that vampires are unique creatures, and many specimens develop outstanding powers and abilities, which make them an even more dangerous opponent. These types of salient abilities and unique powers is commonly found in older vampires with many centuries of existence, but it can also be seen in undead endowed with great power, who control a large number of vampire servants 
or even rule over entire regions and domains. These salient abilities can be unpredictable, like teleportation through the shadows, the ability to pass through walls and solid objects, a touch capable of draining skills and life force in an even more lethal way, or even a constant aura of fear, just to name a few examples. Were it not for the vulnerabilities of these creatures, perhaps there would be no hope for the living and mortals would be slaves to the Night Lords. As hunters of the undead, it is necessary to know and exploit these weaknesses, or otherwise discover ourselves a terrible fate in their hands. Vampires are unique undead, and each hunter must be very careful and prepared. Since a vampire's common weaknesses may not affect some specific individuals, the profane aspect of the vampire existence leaves him vulnerable to the power of a cleric's fate. A devotee of a deity of good will be able to use the strength of his fate and keep a vampire at bay, channeling his devotion through a sacred symbol. These creatures are not easily turned in this way, and there are many hunters who find their end with the sacred symbol in their hands, when their fate was exitant and feeble in the face of the vampire's evil. Clerics devoted to evil entities may be able to control these creatures with the power of their fate, imposing their will on these profane creatures. Vampires forced to serve do so with great reluctance and use all their cunning and intelligence to misrepresent their master's orders, always looking for means of revenge and liberation. A vampire is vulnerable to the touch of blessed water, which can burn them. The use of holy water can be an effective weapon against vampires, but they usually do not do enough damage to destroy or serious injure these undead. The touch of sacred symbols and holy water can also be an important tool to unmask such creatures since some vampires are marked by stigmas when touched by symbols of fate. These stigmata do not regenerate as fast as other wounds and may prevent them from maintaining their mortal facets with impunity for some time, exposing their true nature. The strength of the sacred can also present other limitations to the undead, who are usually unable to enter a place consecrated by fate, such as churches, temples, or even tombs that do not belong to them. A vampire is also unable to enter a creature's home uninvited. Public places and taverns do not seem to impose any restriction on them, but these creatures are unable to enter the simplest of homes without an invitation. Such a limitation does not prevent a vampire from charming his victims to make an invitation or even use other means to force someone out of his residence. The typical vampire usually has a strong aversion to garlic. Whether such an aversion stems from their heightened senses of smell or some supernatural factor is still uncertain, but the fact is that large amounts of garlic repel these creatures and can keep the undead at bay. A great weakness that can denounce a vampire is its absence of reflection, a fact that makes these creatures avoid any proximity to mirrors and reflective surfaces. Some vampires show real fear and aversion to mirrors, and all of them will do anything to escape exposure, keeping such artifacts at a distance. The mirror can be an important weapon for a hunter and a means of correctly identifying his enemies. Another element of vampire's vulnerability is running water. Many believe that a vampire cannot cross running water, but this is a misconception. These monsters can normally cross a bridge or use a boat, but their vulnerability to running water makes them very cautious when making these crossings. A vampire exposed and submerged in running water will suffer great damage and may even be destroyed in this way if kept submerged for some time. 
despite his vulnerability, exposing a vampire to this condition is extremely difficult, especially considering the extraordinary strength and powerful metamorphosis capabilities of these monstrosities. Destroying and hunting a vampire is an extremely arduous task. These creatures have a great resistance and are skilled combatants, and usually when destroyed in combat, take on a gaseous form and return to their coffins, where they undergo a period of regeneration. After a few inert hours in their graves, these vampires regain their consciousness and will quickly recover from the defeat imposed on them. While recovering from a defeat in his grave, or while in his daytime rest, a vampire is vulnerable and this is the best time to be found and destroyed by hunters. The best way to destroy a vampire in these vulnerable conditions is to drive a wooden stake through his heart. Stakes must be made of ash wood or oak and must be driven firmly into their heart to completely paralyze the creature. The stake must go through the heart, and this is not a simple feat, as it requires strength and precision. For hunters who are not as strong or muscular, it is recommended to use a hammer, so that the stake is accurate in its piercing and depth. It is also possible to perform this feat in the middle of a combat, but the feat is even more difficult to accomplish against an active and resisting target. A stake in a vampire's heart will not destroy it, but merely paralyze the creature. The usual method of destroying a vampire after it has been impaled is filling its mouth with sacred symbols and then beheading the monster. Other methods of complete destruction may involve submersion in running water or exposure to sunlight. As painful as it may be for family members, the easiest and most efficient way we can prevent the spread of vampires is to adopt such destruction procedures in possible victims of vampiric attacks. This is not always an easy task, since cultural and religious reasons or even the affective bonds of relatives and friends of the recently deceased can prevent an action from being taken in a timely manner. Most vampires are extremely vulnerable to sunlight and will suffer severe burn damage if exposed to it. Newly created vampires are destroyed almost immediately when in contact with sunlight. Other creatures of great power and age manage to resist some brief exposure, although very weakened, and almost always reject sunlight with instinctive fear. Almost all vampires are totally vulnerable during the day, while they need to rest in their graves to recover their energy. This is the best period of action for hunters, and the safest way to destroy a vampire is to find his daytime refuge, and then proceed with the destruction of his inert body. A typical vampire needs to rest in a coffin or grave that contains soil from the place where he was buried. The difficulties of moving around with such limitations make traveling a moment of extreme vulnerability to a vampire. The need to take coffins with soil from their grave and the vulnerability to sunlight make any long trip a risk factor, which needs a lot of planning, protection of servants and strategy, which make large parts of the vampires fixed and territorial, maintaining hidden and protected lairs. A hunter can use a vampire's limitation to his advantage. Even if he does not find a vulnerable vampire in his coffin, by destroying his resting place and the land of his grave, a hunter can leave a vampire unable to rest and regenerate during daylight, making him more vulnerable in a possible confrontation. It is worth noting, however, that many vampires maintain several hidden refuges. Finding such lairs is a big challenge, since most of the undead adopt elaborate refuges usually hidden and full of defenses, traps and guardians. Van Richten points out in his research that a vampire's wit is always used to protect his refuge. 
the ability to climb walls can, for example, make them hide at the top of a tower inaccessible through any ladder, or at the top of a mountain whose climb is practically impossible. Others take advantage of its gaseous form to hide their tombs in accessible underground locations, which should only through a small crack or fissure in the rock. The old vampire hunter, Van Richten, reveals that he only managed to destroy such a vampire, using wax to seal the fissure he used to enter his resting place, preventing that vampire from returning to his refuge in time, so he finally could be destroyed. But how can we find such creatures, and finally put an end to their profane existence? Some vampires completely lose contact with the mortal world, and become reclusive and wild creatures. Even these monsters, however, need to drink the blood of the living. When victims are found in these areas with signs of vampiric attacks, a hunter must begin to investigate the region in more detail, in search of the lair and power base of these creatures. Some, however, choose to hide amid society and live a life of facade among mortals. These vampires become quite dangerous and influential and use their gifts of domination and cunning to obtain a means of entry into the mortal society. The vampire who lives among mortals depends heavily on his ability to disguise his true nature. His pallor is something that needs to be hidden, which is often circumvented using makeup, magic, or even a constant blood diet. Others establish a convincing story for its morbid aspect, justifying their paleness by some disease that affects his skin tone. The same excuse is used in relation to exposure to the sun, and generally the vampire assumes the role of someone sensitive to light, sick or simply eccentric and eternal. A vampire in these conditions must also avoid participating in situations where he must ingest food, be exposed to mirrors, or enter sacred places, using a wide variety of excuses and justifications to hide his undead nature. Among the many masks assumed by a vampire in society, some are more prevalent. Among the most common roles assumed by vampires is the role of the noble and aristocrat, usually inserted in high society. The proximity to people of influence and power, the high charisma of these creatures, and the greater social tolerance towards the eccentricities of the upper class make the mask of nobility more attractive and doable for a vampire. Others on that ignore the glamour of high society and prefer to infiltrate the underworld in criminality. These vampires become leaders of criminals and murderers organizations, where their gifts and cruelty can emerge to their full potential. Their undead condition can not only give them an edge in this craft, but even be valued by other members of his criminal organization, allowing the vampire not to have to hide his nature from members of his own criminal society. Another mask commonly used by vampires integrated into society is that of the lone adventurer. These vampires use the adventurer's life to justify their absence and amazing gifts, presenting themselves as powerful and reclusive explorers of the unknown, generally justifying their conduct and possessions with fantastic stories of their previous deeds. The masks assumed by vampires in society are always short to leave it, since their inability to grow old make them targets of suspicions after a few years. Some vampires alternate between cities and regions within a few decades, returning to the same place after decades past, as heirs to their previous personas. Others abandon their public personas and continue to participate in society through the shadows, controlling their many servants and minions at distance while planning great games of intrigue and manipulation. As we finish reading and study the Von Richten guides on vampires, we sharpen our stakes and renew our protections to face the long night.
or proximity to the border of Barovia, and the horrible blood-sucking monsters that hunt in their domain make us cautious, but not unprepared to face the dangers that haunt the night. However, it's important to be aware. Stay with us, subscribe to this channel and activate notifications. In our next video, we shall conclude our studies on vampires, as we will explore their different age classifications and powers, and the countless strains of undead that plague the lands of the mists.